Hello! Welcome to Scary Stories, Past and Present. Uh, my name is Jenna Brodsky. I'm a librarian here at Central in the Berkeley Public Library. And today we have with us a special guest, Lauren Rhodes, a local author who specializes in all things horror and death and spooky. <laughs> um, we're so excited to have Lauren with us today. And we're going to be doing a dual reading. Uh, first, we're going to chat with Lauren and she will read from one of her works. And then we will be listening to The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, uh, a classic that both Lauren and I love. So start it off. Lauren, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm Lauren Rhodes. I live in San Francisco. I'm the author of nine books. I had to write it down because I, I can't roll the number off. Um, and the, the one I'm going to read from today is my first full length short story collection. It's called Unsafe Words. And I'm also the editor of a brand new book, a little show and tell, called Death's Garden Revisited. That's um, essays about why people should visit cemeteries around the world. So. Also, I want to mention that we have um, another of Lauren's works, 199 Cemeteries to See Before You Die, <laughs> um, right here at Berkeley Public Library. Go ahead, look on the catalog for it. I really like the book. Um, Thank you. I was I was totally enchanted by it. It was really fun to put together. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the story you chose from Unsafe Words? The one I'm going to read today is called In the Pines, and it's um, it was inspired by well, the, it's originally Muddy Waters singing it, but um, the, particularly the Kurt Cobain version from the, the MTV Unplugged. Um, it's, it's, a, it's not necessarily a murder ballad, but it sounds like a murder ballad, and that's where I spun off from it. There's, there's a bit when Cobain's singing it, and his voice cracks, and it's just the most terrifying emotional thing that I'd ever heard at that point. So yeah, story spun out of that. I love that. I love that it's a story inspired by music. Mm -hmm. I think that there can be a really wonderful relationship between different types of art. So without further ado, please uh, read us in the pines. All right. Hold that up for a minute. Okay. All right. This is called In the Pines. Haley felt herself vanishing into her math homework. The numbers were as concrete as the desk in front of her, brought to life by the soft, warm glow of the desk lamp gilding her math book. Haley was desperate to sink into the problems, solve them, move on, so different from real life. Eventually, she even tuned out the music playing on her phone, something her friend Kat had suggested to help her keep calm. It took Haley a while to surface from working the final problem. Gradually, she became aware of something scratching against her window pane. The snowstorm was bad tonight. Four inches of snow predicted, maybe more. Haley hoped the weather woman was wrong. She hoped the worst of the storm would pass them by. The last thing she wanted was a snow day, forced to stay home with her weeping mother and shouting father. She'd much rather be at school, where work might at least take her mind off of things. The storm scratched more insistently at her window dragging her away from the final math problem again. Sighing, Haley tugged an earbud from one ear. Her room faced Magnolia Street. The old oak tree in the front yard remind, remembered the Civil War. Maybe the wind was enough to make its twigs scratch at her window. When she twisted in her desk chair, the shadow outside the window startled her. Amidst the swirling flakes of snow, the shadow raised a hand to tap on the window glass. Haley almost called her dad. As the sound rose in her throat, she realized she didn't want him here in her cozy room, stomping and shouting and watching her as if she was going to disappear. The shadow put its face closer to the glass. The desk lamp's glow reflected from ice crystals in Miria's hair like diamonds in her black curls. Haley jumped up to open the window to let her sister in. In her haste, the earbuds cord snagged on the desk lamp the lamp toppled over to crash against her math homework. 
shaking loose in its socket. The bulb went dark. Again, Haley almost shouted. Again, she stopped herself. She didn't want to set her mother off on another crying jag. She reached out to turn the window's lock, but the jam had swollen in the cold. Although she yanked on it, the window wouldn't open. You're going to have to push, she said, sure that her voice was too soft for Maria to hear over the storm. Haley didn't want their dad to overhear. Until she made sure her sister was okay, she didn't want her parents to intrude. She was desperate for a moment with Maria all to herself before the world crashed in. She wanted a world without TV cameras and police lights. Maria put her hands flat against the wooden frame and shoved as Haley heaved. The window popped open abruptly. Haley stumbled backward, collided with the bed, and sat down hard. Although Maria waited outside, the snow didn't. It flew into the room, melting as it fell against Haley's face. What are you waiting for? Haley gasped, struggling off the bed. A personal invitation? That was something her dad said. She grimaced. Come in and close the window before we get in trouble. Maria slithered in. She moved in a weird, boneless way, stretching one leg down until her toes touched the carpeted floor, then sliding the other leg in and down before drawing her torso after her. Instead of her purple Converse high tops, the ones that Maria always wore, she had on a pair of black leather boots with sharply pointed toes and even sharper heels. Haley asked, where, where did you get those boots, Maria? In the pines. Her sister's throaty voice was almost unfamiliar. Haley finally untangled her feet from the comforter. She reached over to turn on the floor lamp standing beside the bed. Her sister wore a tiny shimmery dress, barely longer than a bath towel. What Haley had taken for snow crystals on the fabric were actually little glass beads, black on black. The dress made her sister look older than 14. Haley would have sworn Miria was wearing makeup too, bruised purple shadow and a lipstick that gave her mouth a blue. Where'd you get that dress? In the pines. Was that a store? Haley didn't know it, but she'd never been very interested in shopping and girly things. She hadn't thought Mirio had, was either. Where have you been? Haley demanded. Mom and dad have been sick with worry. The cops have been here I don't know how many times. We drove all over town, putting up posters and handing out flyers. They've even been on the news. Maria stared at her, but didn't answer. The icy wind whistled through the room. Miriam made no attempt to shut the window behind her. Haley wanted to reach past her sister to close the window, but something held her back, kept her standing in the circle of light thrown by the floor lamp. Where did you sleep last night? Haley whispered. In the pines, Maria said. In the pines, where the sun never shines. Dress like that? Haley asked. I shivered when the cold wind blew. Haley stared at her sister. In the back of her mind, she could almost hear a song that echoed the things that Maria said. Maybe the bruises around Maria's eyes weren't makeup. Maybe Maria's lips had gone blue. Her parents were just downstairs, watching TV and waiting for news about Miria. Haley knew she could call them. Dad would clomp up the stairs and shout at Miria, and Mom would hang in the doorway and start crying again. Whatever happened next, Haley knew it would be awful. The doorbell rang downstairs. Before anyone could move to answer it, someone pounded on the door. It was the police. That's what the police did whenever they thought they had a lead about her sister. My baby their mother wailed downstairs. Their father yelled for Haley to come down. You coming? Haley asked. Miria shook her head and held out her hand. There was dirt under her broken fingernails. The cold wind howled through Haley's room and both of them shivered. That's the end. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um... I really like that story. Thank you. It has this very haunting atmosphere. It raises a bunch of questions and then refuses to answer them. <laughs> well, I was going for the experience of reading, um, was it scary stories to read in the dark? 
Oh, yes. I loved I those when I was a kid. Yes. It's, it's got that sort of same essence of being, I wouldn't exactly say like short, but sweet. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Some, something bad has happened. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I have to say, I love all of the physical elements that make up that story because a lot of the fear comes from sort of the psychological part of it uh but you you do these great concrete details uh I'm curious if that's something that you're that you were consciously trying to do when you wrote it um I feel like I've noticed that in a few of your stories I I, the thing I like best about stories is the the description the setting um and so I think this, one of the reasons I like Hill House is that she makes things seem normal, you know, but they're just slightly off kilter. And and that's, I like to do that too, where you're, you're sitting in the woods and it's a beautiful sunny day and, and then the deer run by and the deer are freaked out and, you know, there's something scary in the woods that, that, that just wrecks your beautiful day. And so I was trying to do that with just this very normal teenage girl's bedroom. Yeah. And things get a little weird. I think that absolutely comes through. It it's it has the sort of the effect of almost like a fun house mirror of yeah. the normal situation of the the young teenage girl running off somewhere. The parents are worried, the older sister isn't sure how to feel too much is happening at home. Um well I, I think when I was a kid, a lot of the the fear of a situation came because the adults didn't know how to handle it, you know, and they, they're supposed to, and, you know, be yeah. able to, but when something goes wrong, they, they, and for kids, that's really scary. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that you do like, there's a particular vulner, vulnerability when you're, you know, roughly Haley's age, sort of somewhere in high school, where you've taken on a number of more adult responsibilities, especially since she's the older sister. She's not going to tell the parents where the sister is unless she gets, you know, consent for yeah. it. She she feels, you know, protective. She feels older. But then at the same time, you know, that this is her home. She's dependent on her parents. And you're right. When when the adults don't know what to do, that's terrifying for a kid. Yeah. You know, because then where else can they look? Um, I would love if anyone in the audience has a question, if you could drop it in chat um, so we don't have mics going off on top of each other. Uh, and... And we'll ask Lauren. I, I wrote that story for, there's a online group called Ladies of Horror that um, they put up photo challenges every month. And so there's a gang of women who just write these really short, sharp shock stories every month. And uh, I, I can't always do it. I can't always participate. But when I do, you know, the the range of stories that people will get out of the same photo is really amazing. So that one was just a desk lamp on a desk. I love that. Our announcement is going off. <laughs> Sorry about that. That is uh, our the library yeah our, our twice daily reminder here in the library that uh when you're not you know alone running a program when when you're out on the floor you need to be wearing a mask so um <laughs> so yeah i i like that yeah that you you sort of pulled from these two different places of inspiration and can you say the name of the group one more time it's ladies of horror fiction. Um, ladies of horror I fiction. Okay. believe the blog is spreading. Oh. Okay. Thank you. That's, <laughs> that sounds amazing. I encourage everyone to go check that out. Um, we've got a question in the chat. 
Uh, what is your favorite ghost story? Oh my goodness. Um, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, Shirley Jackson's a master talking about uh, I'd be paired with. I chose Shirley Jackson and especially Hill House because that's the first book I read where I had to read the whole thing, you know, <laughs> on, in bed with a flashlight under the covers. I could not stop because I got to the bit where somebody's holding the main character's hand in the middle of the night. I had to know what happened. I <laughs> put it down after that. Yeah. So um, just that sense of things are out of control yeah. <laughs> you don't, and there's really nothing you can do about it. Just you're on the ride till the end of the ride. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, and I think that's, uh, that's sort of the best compliment you can give a writer, right? Is I couldn't stop reading. Uh, and I feel like that frequently with Shirley Jackson. Um, I was so glad you you chose her. I remember reading The Lottery for the first time. And it was actually the first horror story I'd ever read that really scared me. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, for, for people watching, um, we actually have a lot of Jackson's short stories as well here in the library totally encourage you to go check them out uh, the lottery is probably her most famous and definitely worth a read or a listen I think we also have it on audiobook um yeah so I'm so glad that we were able to pair you with that especially because I think there are similarities between the way that the two of you tell stories oh you flatter me <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, I, I, let me try and articulate this. <laughs> I think that there's a focus on the main character's sensations in, in stories where you're focusing more on one person mm -hmm. that I think is very effective for horror because it, puts the reader very firmly in the protagonist's shoes when you're talking about you know the main character's hand being held I remember reading that and like feeling like something was in my hand and you know in in what you just read I you know I had the sensation of the the cold wind blowing in taking a second look at someone and and seeing you know the dress I I also really like what we were talking about earlier that she makes it just like normal, normal. Oh, everything's off kilter. Yeah. Um, something was definitely wrong with Miria the whole time, but it's when you get to the dirty, broken nails is the moment when it's like, there's no non really scary explanation. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I wanted to, to make it clear that something really did happen this is she's just not you know normal teenage girl sneaking back into the house after she's been gone that something something bad has happened someplace and uh, i yeah i thought about going a little farther and explaining it but i felt like that kind of undercut the horror once once you your mind can create things that are so much worse than anything that i would actually put down so i think that that's very true i think that's that's often the problem with, um, speaking of, of Hill House, actually, uh, adapting horror right, literature. Where you have to spell it out. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because I think there is so much power in letting the reader's imagination go wild. Yeah. Uh, I know that pretty much every adaptation of Lovecraft has, uh, he's, he's big on saying, like, I can't even describe this. Right. Uh, and so then, of course... I, I think um, there's a comedian and author I like, um, Cameron Lauder, who was talking about this in a podcast, I believe, and said the problem with adapting uh, Lovecraft to video is that in the book you read, it's an unimaginable horror, and then the viewer in the audience is going, oh, big tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, well, it's it's like seeing alien as opposed yes. to anything further down the line. Um, you know, in the first movie, you, you barely see the monster. You oh, see yeah. like the curve of its head or its tail or something like that. And you're just left to put all those little bits together. And it's you know thoroughly terrifying. And in Aliens, which I love, I, I think it's a great movie, but, you know, they had to make it scary by making more and more and more because they showed you everything. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a very true problem. Um, oh, we've got another question in the chat that I actually, I love this. Have you seen a ghost? Yes. When when I moved into this house, um, <laughs> we knew when we bought the house that somebody had died in it. Um, in I don't know if that's true in Berkeley, but in San Francisco, they're required to tell you if somebody's died in the house in the last couple of years. Um, in the last couple of years, yeah. may be true in Berkeley. Yeah, it's it's like, like three years. It's a really specific number, which I think is strange because what if it was three and a half years, but right. really three years ago, um, it was an elderly woman who'd lived alone and she died in the house. And so when we first moved in, all kinds of weird things would happen. You know, sounds like footsteps going down the hallway and um my office this is a breakfast nook and so there's a atrium in the middle and then our dining room is on the other side and it is lined with bookshelves and so one day I was sitting here watching the bookshelves go or the books go off the bookshelves just one at a time kind of like a waterfall just you know they were stacked up and, and they just... all fell down in a pile <laughs> on the floor I, I mean I could not have done that if I tried to do that but it was it was weird we had a lot of weird electrical stuff going on and I mean I finally my husband was traveling a lot at the time and I had to sit down one night with the ghost and say look you cannot scare me you know if you keep scaring me I'm gonna have an exorcist come in here we're gonna put an end to this but you know you were here first and if you want to just hang out and you know continue to stay here that's fine you know we were trying to get pregnant at the time and and I was like you know when I when my kid is born you cannot do anything to her but I knew this woman had been like an Italian granny and so you know right I very, enlisted very her to kind of watch here. over my kid yeah. yeah so you know in the long run I think it's been a good thing and we've been here more than 20 years this definitely less this time's gone on but in the first couple of years it, it was crazy just yeah. weird stuff going on I, I love I feel like this ghost was a very tidy woman stacking those books up. <laughs> it's it's interesting how you know what whether you believe in ghosts or not listening to this um all the different ghost stories that you will hear from people I think it's very interesting what different personalities are brought to light yeah yeah, well, you know, she was the first owner of this house. They bought it in 1940. So she'd lived here, I don't know, was that 60 years, almost 60 years? Yeah. In, in 60 years, a lot of your emotions going to seep into a place. So whether it was, you know, a ghost, it was the actual yeah. woman or just kind of an echo of everything, it, it doesn't matter to me. It had the same effect for me. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I've never run into a, a really scary, violent ghost, but I yeah. can believe that there are some. I mean, there must be out there. You do hear stories. Um, yeah, there's a there's a benevolent ghost um, in Central Branch uh, here at Berkeley Public. That's cool. Um, yeah, I, I've not had the chance to meet her, but... Uh, she was um sue smith who was one of the librarians who helped design the current form of our building uh and i've heard from co-workers that particularly when changes are being made to how we arrange stuff um she'll just come check in i had a co-worker tell me that he was rearranging things and you know he he heard her basically say, what are you doing? Not in like an <laughs> upset tone, but in a genuinely curious tone. And when he turned around, there was 
you know, a woman dressed very sharply in the style of her day. Uh, just kind of watching him and then she faded off. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, hopefully she she like helps to shelve the books and stuff like that. That too. would be that would be great. I bet our circulation staff would really appreciate that. <laughs> Put the ghosts uh, to work. Yes. Um, I see that we've got a couple new people. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for Lower and Rhodes, first of all, don't be worried that you missed the first part of the reading. It's going up on YouTube. Um, but if you have any questions for local horror author Lauren Rhodes, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll pass them on. Uh, and then I think in a few more minutes, we will get to listen to Haunting of Hill House. Excellent. I'm actually curious about the the ghost in your house. You mentioned um, <laughs> basically sitting down with her and then talking about the, uh, I guess, co-living situation. <laughs> um, I find that a really interesting theme that you find in, in some horror stuff um, is sort of whether the characters see ghosts or other supernatural elements as something invading or sharing. Um, I'm curious if you sort of have a preference for which, which type of story. Well, I was in my own life, I was a little concerned because we lived down the block from what used to be this huge mortuary and the, uh, the old streetcar Tacoma used to go down our street. So, you know, if somebody died in the city, they couldn't be buried in San Francisco. They had to be transported down to Colma and um, I didn't want it to be anybody any transient ghost you know if it was going to be if we were going to be haunted I wanted it to be somebody connected to the house I didn't want somebody just passing just through hanging and out stirring <laughs> up trouble and then leaving um, right. oh, I, I don't know I think most of the stories you read there it's a spirit that's tied to a place mm -hmm. it's either someplace they worked or someplace they lived so yeah, maybe that's something that should be explored more. Yeah, I, I find that really interesting. Um, we've got a great question in the chat. I know Lauren has published books on touring cemeteries. What is her fascination with them? Is it the variety of monuments? Oh my goodness, that's such a big question. <laughs> yes. um, Sorry, I'm going to hand you a huge one right at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh... Uh, there's so many things I like about cemeteries. It's really hard for me to to start. Um, I started visiting them because it was kind of a quiet place. I I don't know if I'm neurotypical or not. I've never been tested, but I tend to get overwhelmed by things, uh, especially when you're traveling and you're dealing with money and languages and you know unfamiliar streets. And I I'm slightly dyslexic, so I. I reverse left and right. So reading a map for me is really complicated. So um, we'd go to the cemeteries just so I'd have like this quiet space where, uh, you know, I could soak in the sunshine and look at green grass and, and all of that. And I slowly started to get interested in uh, particularly angel sculptures. And my poor husband is long suffering. I will drag him just throughout the entire cemetery because they'll say oh I just need to see one more angel this one over there and you know then by the time you've walked the, the whole 80 acres or whatever you've seen everything but um yeah I think it's the sculpture that draws me most uh I think of cemeteries as kind of uh public sculpture gardens that are free you know anybody can walk <laughs> in and look at them and so I think that's really cool yeah I love that that's um and I'm gonna shout out again ah a person in the chat says great answer thanks thanks Bill <laughs> um yeah and I do want to shout out again you edited that new book of essays also concern concerning cemeteries um I'm worried That's I'm starting to revisit it <laughs> yes yeah uh, it's a big I'll hold it up for us sure one more time yeah yeah I'd love to that's it Yes, so I was uh, so worried I would say it wrong if I said it instead of you. <laughs> no, it's the original book 
I published, geez, a million years ago called uh, Death's Garden. And, and so this is 30 years later, I get around to redoing it, but it's, it's illustrated and um, there are 40 essays talk, talking about cemeteries all around the world. So I'm so cool. very proud of it. Yes. Uh, and if you're interested in even more cemeteries, I'll plug again. I loved this book, 199 Cemeteries to See Before You Die, also by Lauren in the Berkeley Public Library Collection. So uh, thank you so much for the reading, for answering our questions. I think that we're going to get into Shirley Jackson. Uh, for those who missed me announcing it earlier, we actually do have some of Jackson on vinyl. We have The Summer People and The Little House, um, which you can listen to on the fifth floor. Or if you have a record player at home, you can even check it out, take it home, listen there. Uh, the fifth floor at Central Branch is completely reopening on November 7th. And that includes our little vinyl record listening station. Let's show off our, our turntable there. Um, behind me is like three out of probably 50 shelves crammed full of records. There's so much to come appreciate. Records don't hold that much, so we do not have a recording of Hill House, but we do own it as an ebook narrated by David Warner, and that's what we'll be listening to today. So if you will give me one moment to get that set up. Oh, that's. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Um, thank, thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate you taking time out on a Monday afternoon. So hopefully this has made uh, everyone's lunch a little bit better. Uh, why are you not? We're gonna have a slight tech difficulty as it uh, as it refuses to open properly. All right, there we go. Let me just. Thank you for your patience. And let's enjoy Bill House. The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within, Walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. Dr. John Montague was a doctor of philosophy. He had taken his degree in anthropology, feeling obscurely that in this field he might come closest to his true vocation, the analysis of supernatural manifestations. He was scrupulous about the use of his title because, his investigations being so utterly unscientific, he hoped to borrow an air of respectability, even scholarly authority, from his education. It had cost him a good deal in money and pride, since he was not a begging man, to rent Hill House for three months, but he expected absolutely to be compensated for his pains by the sensation following upon the publication of his definitive work on the causes and effects of psychic disturbances in a house commonly known as haunted. He had been looking for an honestly haunted house all his life. 
When he heard of Hill House, he had been at first doubtful, then hopeful, then indefatigable. He was not the man to let go of Hill House once he had found it. Dr. Montague's intentions with regard to Hill House derived from the methods of the intrepid 19th century ghost hunters. He was going to go and live in Hill House and see what happened there. It was his intention at first to follow the example of the anonymous lady who went to stay at Balichin House and ran a summer-long house party for skeptics and believers, with croquet and ghost-watching as the outstanding attractions, but skeptics, believers and good croquet players are harder to come by today. Dr. Montague was forced to engage assistance. Perhaps the leisurely ways of Victorian life lent themselves more agreeably to the devices of psychic investigation, or perhaps the painstaking documentation of phenomena has largely gone out as a means of determining actuality. At any rate, Dr. Montague had not only to engage assistants, but to search for them. Because he thought of himself as careful and conscientious, he spent considerable time looking for his assistants. He combed the records of the psychic societies, the backfires of sensational newspapers, the reports of parapsychologists, and assembled a list of names of people who had, in one way or another, at one time or another, no matter how briefly or dubiously, been involved in abnormal events. From his list, he first eliminated the names of people who were dead. When he had then crossed off the names of those who seemed to him publicity seekers, of subnormal intelligence or unsuitable because of a clear tendency to take the centre of the stage, he had a list of perhaps a dozen names. Each of these people then received a letter from Dr. Montague extending an invitation to spend all or part of a summer at a comfortable country house, old but perfectly equipped with plumbing, electricity, central heating and clean mattresses. The purpose of their stay, the letter stated clearly, was to observe and explore the various unsavoury stories which had been circulated about the house for most of its 80 years of existence. Dr. Montague's letters did not say openly that Hill House was haunted, because Dr. Montague was a man of science, and until he had actually experienced a psychic manifestation in Hill House, he would not trust his luck too far. Consequently, his letters had a certain ambiguous dignity calculated to catch at the imagination of a very special sort of reader. To his dozen letters, Dr. Montague had four replies, the other eight or so candidates having presumably moved and left no forwarding address or possibly having lost interest in the supernormal or even perhaps never having existed at all. To the four who replied, Dr. Montague wrote again, naming a specific day when the house would be officially regarded as ready for occupancy and enclosing detailed directions for reaching it since, as he was forced to explain, information about finding the house was extremely difficult to get particularly from the rural community which surrounded it. On the day before he was to leave for Hill House, Dr. Montague was persuaded to take into his select company a representative of the family who owned the house, and a telegram arrived from one of his candidates, backing out with a clearly manufactured excuse. Another never came or wrote, perhaps because of some pressing personal problem which had intervened. The other two came. Eleanor Vance was 32 years old when she came to Hill House. The only person in the world she genuinely hated, now that her mother was dead, was her sister. She disliked her brother-in-law and her five-year-old niece, and she had no friends. This was owing largely to the 11 years she had spent caring for her invalid mother, which had left her with some proficiency as a nurse and an inability to face strong sunlight without blinking. She could not remember even being truly happy in her adult life. Her years with her mother had been built up devotedly around small guilts and small reproaches, constant weariness and unending despair. Without ever wanting to become reserved and shy, she had spent so long alone, with no one to love, that it was difficult for her to talk even casually to another person without self-consciousness and an awkward inability to find words. Her name had turned up on Dr. Montague's list because one day, when she was 12 years old and her sister was 18, and her father had been dead for not quite a month, showers of stones had fallen on their house without any warning or any indication of purpose or reason, dropping from the ceilings, rolling loudly down the walls, breaking windows and pattering maddeningly on the roof. The stones continued intermittently for three days during which time Eleanor and her sister were less unnerved by the stones than by the neighbours and sightseers who gathered daily outside the front door, and by their mother's blind hysterical insistence that all of this was due to malicious, backbiting people on the block who had had it in for her ever since she came. After three days, Eleanor and her sister were removed to the house of a friend, 
and the stones stopped falling. Nor did they ever return, although Eleanor and her sister and her mother went back to living in the house, and the feud with the entire neighborhood was never ended. The story had been forgotten by everyone except the people Dr. Montague consulted. It had certainly been forgotten by Eleanor and her sister, each of whom had supposed at the time that the other was responsible. During the whole underside of her life, ever since her first memory, Eleanor had been waiting for something like Hill House. Caring for her mother, lifting a cross old lady from her chair to her bed, setting out endless little trays of soup and oatmeal, stealing herself to the filthy laundry, Eleanor had held fast to the belief that someday something would happen. She had accepted the invitation to Hill House by return mail, although her brother-in-law had insisted upon calling a couple of people to make sure that this doctor fellow was not aiming to introduce Eleanor to savage rights not unconnected with matters Eleanor's sister deemed it improper for an unmarried woman to know. Perhaps Eleanor's sister whispered in the privacy of the marital bedroom. Perhaps Dr. Montague, if that really was his name after all, Perhaps this Dr. Montague used these women for some, well, experiments. You know, experiments the way they do. Eleanor's sister dwelt richly upon experiments she had heard these doctors did. Eleanor had no such ideas, or having them, was not afraid. Eleanor, in short, would have gone anywhere. Theodora. That was as much name as she used. Her sketches were signed Theo, and on her apartment door, and the window of her shop, and her telephone listing, and her pale stationery, and the bottom of the lovely photograph of her which stood on the mantel, the name was always only Theodora. Theodora was not at all like Eleanor. Duty and conscience were, for Theodora, attributes which belonged properly to the Girl Scouts. Theodora's world was one of delight and soft colours. She had come into Dr. Montague's list because, going laughing into the laboratory, bringing with her a rush of floral perfume, she had somehow been able, amused and excited over her own incredible skill, to identify correctly 18 cards out of 20, 15 cards out of 20, 19 cards out of 20, held up by an assistant out of sight and hearing. The name of Theodora shone in the records of the laboratory and so came inevitably to Dr. Montague's attention. Theodora had been entertained by Dr. Montague's first letter and answered it out of curiosity. Perhaps the wakened knowledge in Theodora, which told her the names of symbols on cards held out of sight, urged her on her way toward Hill House, and yet fully intended to decline the invitation. Yet, perhaps the stirring, urgent sense again, when Dr. Montague's confirming letter arrived, Theodora had been tempted and had somehow plunged blindly, wantonly, into a violent quarrel with the friend with whom she shared an apartment. Things were said on both sides which only time could eradicate. Theodora had deliberately and heartlessly smashed the lovely little figurine her friend had carved of her, and her friend had cruelly ripped to shreds the volume of Alfred de Musset, which had been a birthday present from Theodora, taking particular pains with the page which bore Theodora's loving, teasing inscription. These acts were, of course, unforgettable, and before they could laugh over them together, time would have to go by. Theodora had written that night, accepting Dr. Montague's invitation, and departed in cold silence the next day. Luke Sanderson was a liar. He was also a thief. His aunt, who was the owner of Hill House, was fond of pointing out that her nephew had the best education, the best clothes, the best taste, and the worst companions of anyone she had ever known. She would have leaped at any chance to put him safely away for a few weeks. The family lawyer was prevailed upon to persuade Dr. Montague that the house could on no account be rented to him for his purposes without the confining presence of a member of the family during his stay. And perhaps at their first meeting, the doctor perceived in Luke a kind of strength or cat-like instinct for self-preservation, which made him almost as anxious as Mrs. Sanderson to have Luke with him in the house. At any rate, Luke was amused, his aunt grateful, and Dr. Montague more than satisfied. Mrs. Sanderson told the family lawyer that at any rate there was really nothing in the house Luke could steal. The old silver there was of some value, she told the lawyer, but it represented an almost insuperable difficulty for Luke. It required energy to steal it and transform it into money. Mrs. Sanderson did Luke an injustice. Luke was not at all likely to make off with the family silver. 
or Dr. Montague's watch, or Theodora's bracelet. His dishonesty was largely confined to taking petty cash from his aunt's pocketbook and cheating at cards. He was also apt to sell the watches and cigarette cases given him fondly and with pretty blushes by his aunt's friends. Someday Luke would inherit Hill House, but he had never thought to find himself living in it. I just don't think she should take the car is all, Eleanor's brother-in-law said stubbornly. It's half my car, Eleanor said. I help pay for it. I just don't think she should take it is all, her brother-in-law said. He appealed to his wife. It isn't fair she should have the use of it for the whole summer and us have to do without. Carrie drives it all the time and I never even take it out of the garage, Eleanor said. Besides, you'll be in the mountains all summer and you can't use it there. Carrie, you know you won't use the car in the mountains. But suppose poor little Linny got sick or something and we needed a car to get her to a doctor. It's half my car, Eleanor said. I mean to take it. Suppose even Carrie got sick. Suppose we couldn't get a doctor and needed to go to a hospital. I want it. I mean to take it. I don't think so. Carrie spoke slowly, deliberately. We don't know where you're going, do we? You haven't seen fit to tell us very much about all this, have you? I don't think I can see my way clear to letting you borrow my car. It's half my car. No, Carrie said. You may not. Right, Eleanor's brother-in-law nodded. We need it, like Carrie says. Carrie smiled slightly. I'd never forgive myself, Eleanor, if I lent you the car and something happened. How do we know we can trust this doctor fellow? You're still a young woman, after all, and the car is worth a good deal of money. Well, now, Carrie, I did call Homer in the credit office, and he said this fellow was in good standing at some college or other. Carrie said, still smiling. Of course, there is every reason to suppose that he is a decent man, but Eleanor does not choose to tell us where she is going or how to reach her if we want the car back. Something could happen, and we might never know. Even if Eleanor, she went on, delicately addressing her teacup, even if Eleanor is prepared to run off to the ends of the earth at the invitation of any man, there is still no reason why she should be permitted to take my car with her. It's half my car. Suppose poor little Linny got sick up there in the mountains with nobody around, no doctor. In any case, Eleanor, I'm sure that I'm doing what Mother would have thought best. Mother had confidence in me and would certainly never have approved my letting you run wild going off heaven knows where in my car. Or suppose even I got sick up there in... I'm sure Mother would have agreed with me, Eleanor. Besides, Eleanor's brother-in-law said, struck by a sudden idea, how do we know she'd bring it back in good condition? There has to be a first time for everything, Eleanor told herself. She got out of the taxi, very early in the morning, trembling because by now, perhaps, her sister and her brother-in-law might be stirring with the first faint proddings of suspicion. She took her suitcase quickly out of the taxi while the driver lifted out the cardboard carton which had been on the front seat. Eleanor overtipped him, wondering if her sister and brother-in-law were following, were perhaps even now turning into the street and telling each other, there she is, just as we thought, the thief, there she is. She turned in haste to go into the huge city garage where their car was kept, glancing nervously toward the ends of the street. She crashed into a very little lady, sending packages in all directions, and saw with dismay a bag upset and break on the sidewalk, spilling out a broken piece of cheesecake, tomato slices, and a hard roll. Damn you! Damn you! The little lady screamed, her face pushed up close to Eleanor's. I was taking it home! Damn you! Damn you! I'm so sorry, Eleanor said. She bent down, but it did not seem possible to scoop up the fragments of tomato and cheesecake and shove them somehow back into the broken bag. The old lady was scowling down and snatching up her other packages before Eleanor could reach them, and at last Eleanor rose, smiling in convulsive apology. I'm really so sorry, she said. Damn you, the little old lady said, but more quietly. I was taking it home for my little lunch, and now, thanks to you, perhaps I could pay. Eleanor took hold of her pocketbook, and the little lady stood very still and thought. I couldn't take money just like that, she said at last. I didn't buy the things, you see. They were left over. She snapped her lips angrily. You should have seen the ham they had, she said. But someone else got that. And the chocolate cake. And the potato salad. And the little candies and the little paper dishes. I was too late on everything. And now... She and Eleanor both glanced down at the mess on the sidewalk. The little lady said, 
So you see, I couldn't just take money, not money just from your hand, not for something that was left over. May I buy you something to replace this then? I'm in a terrible hurry, but if we could find some place that's open. The little old lady smiled wickedly. I've still got this anyway, she said, and she hugged one package tight. You may pay my taxi fare home, she said, that no one else will be likely to knock me down. Gladly, Eleanor said and turned to the taxi driver who had been waiting, interested. Can you take this lady home, she asked. A couple of dollars will do it, the little lady said. Not including the tip for this gentleman, of course. Being as small as I am, she explained daintily, it's quite a hazard. Quite a hazard indeed, people knocking you down. Still, it's a genuine pleasure to find one as willing as you to make up for it. Sometimes the people who knock you down never turn once to look. With Eleanor's help, she climbed into the taxi with her packages, and Eleanor took two dollars and a fifty-cent piece from her pocketbook and handed them to the little lady who clutched them tight in her tiny hand. All right, sweetheart, the taxi driver said. Where do we go? The little lady chuckled. I'll tell you after we start, she said, and then to Eleanor. Good luck to you, dearie. Watch out from now on how you go knocking people down. Goodbye, Eleanor said. And I'm really very sorry. That's fine, then, the little lady said, waving at her as the taxi pulled away from the curb. I'll be praying for you, dearie. Well, Eleanor thought, staring after the taxi, there's one person anyway who will be praying for me. One person anyway. It was the first genuinely shining day of summer. A time of year which brought Ellen always to aching memories of her early childhood when it had seemed to be summer all the time. She could not remember a winter before her father's death on a cold, wet day. She had taken to wondering lately during these swift-counted years what had been done with all those wasted summer days. How could she have spent them so wantonly? I am foolish, she told herself early every summer. I am very foolish. I am grown up now and know the value of things. Nothing is ever really wasted, she believed sensibly, even one's childhood. And then each year, one summer morning, the warm wind would come down the city street where she walked, and she would be touched with a little cold thought. I have let more time go by. Yet this morning, driving the little car which she and her sister owned together, apprehensive lest they might still realize that she had come, after all, and just taken it away, going docilely along the street, following the lines of traffic, stopping when she was bidden and turning when she could. She smiled out at the sunlight, slanting along the street, and thought, I am going, I am going, I have finally taken a step. Always before, when she had her sister's permission to drive the little car, she had gone cautiously, moving with extreme care to avoid even the slightest scratch or mar which might irritate her sister, but today, with her carton on the back seat and her suitcase on the floor, her gloves and pocketbook and light coat on the seat beside her. The car belonged entirely to her. A little contained world, all her own. I'm really going, she thought. At the last traffic light in the city, before she turned to go onto the great highway out of town, she stopped, waiting, and slid Dr. Montague's letter out of her pocketbook. I will not even need a map, she thought. He must be a very careful man. Route 39 to Ashton, the letter said, and then turn left onto Route 5 going west. Follow this for a little less than 30 miles and you will come to the small village of Hillsdale. Go through Hillsdale to the corner with a gas station on the left and a church on the right, and turn left here onto what seems to be a narrow country road. You will be going up into the hills and the road is very poor. Follow this road to the end, about six miles, and you will come to the gates of Hill House. I am making these directions so detailed because it is inadvisable to stop in Hillsdale to ask your way. The people there are rude to strangers and openly hostile to anyone inquiring about Hill House. I am very happy that you will be joining us in Hill House and will take great pleasure in making your acquaintance on Thursday the 21st of June. The light changed. She turned onto the highway and was free of the city. No one she thought, can catch me now. They don't even know which way I'm going. She had never driven far alone before. The notion of dividing her lovely journey into miles and hours was silly. She saw it 
bringing her car with precision between the line on the road and the line of trees beside the road, as a passage of moments, each one new, carrying her along with them, taking her down a path of incredible novelty to a new place. The journey itself was her positive action, her destination vague, unimagined, perhaps non-existent. She meant to savour each turn of her travelling, loving the road and the trees and the houses and the small, ugly towns, teasing herself with the notion that she might take it into her head to stop just anywhere and never leave again. She might pull her car to the side of the highway, although that was not allowed, she told herself, she would be punished if she really did, and leave it behind while she wandered off past the trees into the soft, welcoming country beyond. She might wander till she was exhausted, chasing butterflies or following a stream, and then come at nightfall to the hut of some poor woodcutter who would offer her shelter. She might make her home forever in East Barrington or Desmond or the incorporated village of Burke. She might never leave the road at all, but just hurry on and on until the wheels of the car were worn to nothing and she had come to the end of the world. And, she thought, I might just go along to Hill House, where I'm expected and where I'm being given shelter and room and board and a small token salary and consideration of forsaking my commitments and involvements in the city and running away to see the world. I wonder what Dr. Montague is like. I wonder what Hill House is like. I wonder who else will be there. She was well away from the city now, watching for the turning onto Route 39, that magic thread of road Dr. Montague had chosen for her, out of all the roads in the world, to bring her safely to him and to Hill House. No other road could lead her from where she was to where she wanted to be. Dr. Montague was confirmed, made infallible, under the sign which pointed the way to Route 39 was another sign saying, Ashton, 121 miles. The road, her intimate friend now, turned and dipped, going around turns where surprises waited. Once a cow regarding her over a fence, once an incurious dog, down into hollows where small towns lay, past fields and orchards. On the main street of one village she passed a vast house, pillared and walled, with shutters over the windows and a pair of stone lions guarding the steps, and she thought that perhaps she might live there dusting the lions each morning and patting their heads good night. Time is beginning this morning in June, she assured herself, but it is a time that is strangely new and of itself. In these few seconds I have lived a lifetime in a house with two lions in front. Every morning I swept the porch and dusted the lions, and every evening I patted their heads good night, and once a week I washed their faces and manes and paws with warm water and soda and cleaned between their teeth with a swab. Inside the house the rooms were tall and clear, with shining floors and polished windows. A little dainty old lady took care of me, moving starchly with a silver tea service on a tray and bringing me a glass of elderberry wine each evening for my health's sake. I took my dinner alone in the long, quiet dining room at the gleaming table, and between the tall windows the white panelling of the walls shone in the candlelight. I dined upon a bird and radishes from the garden and homemade plum jam. When I slept it was under a canopy of white organdy, and a nightlight guarded me from the hall. People bowed to me on the streets of the town because everyone was very proud of my lions when I died. She had left the town far behind by now, and was going past dirty closed lunch stands and torn signs. There had been a fair somewhere near here once, long ago, with motorcycle races. The signs still carried fragments of words. Dare, one of them read, and another, Evil. And she laughed at herself, perceiving how she sought out omens everywhere. The word is Dare Devil, Eleanor. Dare devil drivers, and she slowed her car because she was driving too fast and might reach Hill House too soon. At one spot she stopped altogether beside the road to stare in disbelief and wonder. Along the road for perhaps a quarter of a mile she had been passing and admiring a row of splendid tendered oleanders, blooming pink and white in a steady row. Now she had come to the gateway they protected, and past the gateway the trees continued. The gateway was no more than a pair of ruined stone pillars, with a road leading away between them into empty fields. She could see that the oleander trees cut away from the road and ran up each side of a great square, and she could see all the way to the farthest side of the square, 
which was a line of oleander trees seemingly going along a little river. Inside the oleander square there was nothing, no house, no building, nothing but the straight road going across and ending at the stream. Now what was here, she wondered. What was here and is gone? Or what was going to be here and never came? Was it going to be a house or a garden or an orchard? Were they driven away forever or are they coming back? Oleanders are poisonous, she remembered. Could they be here guarding something? Will I, she thought, will I get out of my car and go between the ruined gates and then, once I'm in the magic Oleander Square, find that I have wandered into a fairy land, protected poisonously from the eyes of people passing? Once I have stepped between the magic gate posts, will I find myself through the protective barrier, the spell, broken? I will go into a sweet garden with fountains and no benches and roses trained over arbors and find one path, jeweled perhaps with rubies and emeralds, soft enough for a king's daughter to walk upon with her little sandaled feet, and it will lead me directly to the palace which lies under a spell. I will walk up low stone steps past stone lions guarding and into a courtyard where a fountain plays and the queen waits, weeping, for the princess to return. She will drop her embroidery when she sees me and cry out to the palace servants, stirring at last after their long sleep, to prepare a great feast because the enchantment is ended and the palace is itself again, and we shall live happily ever after. No, of course, she thought, turning to start her car again. Once the palace becomes visible and the spell is broken, the whole spell will be broken and all this countryside outside the Oleanders will return to its proper form fading away towns and signs and cows into a soft green picture from the fairy tale. Then, coming down from the hills, there will be a prince riding, bright and green and silver, with a hundred bowmen riding behind him, pennants stirring, horses tossing, jewels flashing. She laughed and turned to smile goodbye at the magic oleanders. Another day, she told them, another day I'll come back and break your spell. She stopped for lunch after she had driven a hundred miles and a mile. She found a country restaurant which advertised itself as an old mill and found herself seated incredibly upon a balcony overlooking a dashing stream, looking down upon wet rocks and the intoxicating sparkle of moving water with a cut glass bowl of cottage cheese on the table before her and corn sticks in a napkin. Because this was a time and a land where enchantments were swiftly made and broken, she wanted to linger over her lunch, knowing that Hill House always waited for her at the end of the day. The only other people in the dining room were a family party, a mother and father with a small boy and girl, and they talked to one another softly and gently. And once the little girl turned and regarded Eleanor with frank curiosity and after a minute smiled, the lights from the stream below touched the ceiling and the polished tables and glanced along the little girl's curls, and the little girl's mother said, She wants her cup of stars. Eleanor looked up, surprised. The little girl was sliding back in her chair, sullenly refusing her milk, while her father frowned and her brother giggled, and her mother said calmly, She wants her cup of stars. Indeed, yes, Eleanor thought, indeed, so do I. A cup of stars of course. Her little cup, the mother was explaining, smiling apologetically at the waitress, who was thunderstruck at the thought that the mill's good country milk was not rich enough for the little girl. It has stars in the bottom, and she always drinks her milk from it at home. She calls it her cup of stars, because she can see the stars while she drinks her milk. The waitress nodded, unconvinced, and the mother told the little girl, you'll have your milk from your cup of stars tonight when we get home. But just for now, just be a very good little girl. Will you take a little milk from this glass? Don't do it, Eleanor told the little girl. Insist on your cup of stars. Once they have trapped you into being like everyone else, you will never see your cup of stars again. Don't do it. The little girl glanced at her and smiled a little, subtle, dimpling, holy, comprehending smile and shook her head stubbornly at the glass. Brave girl, Eleanor thought. Wise, brave girl. You're spoiling her, the father said. She ought not to be allowed these whims. Just this once, the mother said. She put down the glass of milk and touched the little girl gently on the hand. Eat your ice cream, she said. When they left, the little girl waved goodbye to Eleanor, and Eleanor waved back, 
sitting in joyful loneliness to finish her coffee while the gay stream tumbled along below her. I have not very much farther to go, Eleanor thought. I'm more than halfway there. Journey's end, she thought. And far back in her mind, sparkling like the little stream, a tag end of a tune danced through her head, bringing distantly a word or so. In delay there lies no plenty, she thought. In delay there lies no plenty. She nearly stopped forever just outside Ashton, because she came to a tiny cottage buried in a garden. I could live here all alone, she thought, slowing the car to look down the winding garden path to the small blue front door with, perfectly, a white cat on the step. No one would ever find me there either, behind all those roses, and just to make sure I would plant oleanders by the road. I will light a fire in the cool evenings and toast apples at my own hearth. I will raise white cats and sew white curtains for the windows and sometimes come out of my door to go to the store to buy cinnamon and tea and thread. People will come to me to have their fortunes told, and I will brew love potions for sad maidens. I will have a robin. But the cottage was far behind, and it was time to look for her new road, so carefully charted by Dr. Montague. Turn left onto Route 5, going west, his letter said and, as efficiently and promptly as though he had been guiding her from some spot far away, moving her car with controls in his hands, it was done. She was on Route 5 going west, and her journey was nearly done. In spite of what he said, though, she thought, I will stop in Hillsdale for a minute, just for a cup of coffee, because I cannot bear to have my long trip end so soon. It was not really disobeying, anyway. The letter said it was inadvisable to stop in Hillsdale to ask the way. Not forbidden to stop for coffee, and perhaps if I don't mention Hill House I will not be doing wrong. Anyway, she thought obscurely, it's my last chance. Hillsdale was upon her before she knew it, a tangled, disorderly mess of dirty houses and crooked streets. It was small. Once she had come onto the main street she could see the corner at the end of the gas station and the church. There seemed to be only one place to stop for coffee and that was an unattractive diner, but Eleanor was bound to stop in Hillsdale, and so she brought her car to the broken curb in front of the diner and got out. After a minute's thought, with a silent nod to Hillsdale, she locked the car, mindful of her suitcase on the floor and the carton on the back seat. I will not spend long in Hillsdale, she thought, looking up and down the street, which managed, even in the sunlight, to be dark and ugly. A dog slept uneasily. In the shade against a wall, a woman stood in a doorway across the street and looked at Eleanor, and two young boys lounged against a fence, elaborately silent. Eleanor, who was afraid of strange dogs and jeering women and young hoodlums, went quickly into the diner, clutching her pocketbook and her car keys. Inside, she found a counter with a chinless, tired girl behind it, and a man sitting at the end, eating. She wondered briefly how hungry he must have been to come in here at all, when she looked at the grey counter at the smeared glass bowl over a plate of doughnuts. Coffee, she said to the girl behind the counter, and the girl turned wearily and tumbled out a cup from the piles on the shelves. I will have to drink this coffee because I said I was going to, Eleanor told herself sternly. But next time I will listen to Dr. Montague. There was some elaborate joke going on between the man eating and the girl behind the counter. When she set Eleanor's coffee down, she glanced at him and half smiled, and he shrugged, and then the girl laughed. Eleanor looked up, but the girl was examining her fingernails, and the man was wiping his plate with bread. Perhaps Eleanor's coffee was poisoned. It certainly looked it. Determined to plumb the village of Hillsdale to its lowest depths, Eleanor said to the girl, "'I'll have one of those doughnuts too, please.' and the girl, glancing sideways at the man, slid one of the doughnuts onto a dish and set it down in front of Eleanor and laughed when she caught another look from the man. This is a pretty little town, Eleanor said to the girl. What's it called? The girl stared at her. Perhaps no one had ever before had the audacity to call Hillsdale a pretty little town. After a moment, the girl looked again at the man as though calling for confirmation and said, Hillsdale. Have you lived here long? Eleanor asked. I'm not going to mention Hill House, she assured Dr. Montague far away. I just want to waste a little time. Yeah, the girl said. It must be pleasant living in a small town like this. I come from the city. 
Yeah? Do you like it here? It's all right, the girl said. She looked again at the man who was listening carefully. Not much to do. How large a town is it? Pretty small. You want more coffee? This was addressed to the man who was rattling his cup against his saucer, and Eleanor took a first shuddering sip of her own coffee and wondered how he could possibly want more. Do you have a lot of visitors around here? She asked when the girl had filled the coffee cup and gone back to lounge against the shelves. Tourists, I mean. What for? For a minute the girl flashed at her from what might have been an emptiness greater than any Eleanor had ever known. Why would anybody come here? She looked sullenly at the man and added, There's not even a movie. But the hills are so pretty. Mostly with small out-of-the-way towns like this one, you'll find city people who have come and built themselves homes up in the hills for privacy. The girl laughed shortly. Not here, they don't. All remodeling old houses. Privacy, the girl said and laughed again. It just seems surprising, Eleanor said, feeling the man looking at her. Yeah, the girl said. But they'd put in a movie, even. I thought, Eleanor said carefully, that I might even look around. Old houses are usually cheap, you know, and it's fun to make them over. Not around here, the girl said. Then, Eleanor said, there are no old houses around here, back in the hills? Nope. The man rose, taking change from his pocket, and spoke for the first time. People leave this town, he said. They don't come here. When the door closed behind him, the girl turned her flat eyes back to Eleanor, almost resentfully, as though Eleanor, with her chatter, had driven the man away. He was right, she said finally. They go away, the lucky ones. Why don't you run away? Eleanor asked her, and the girl shrugged. Would I be any better off? she asked. She took Eleanor's money without interest and returned the change. Then, with another of her quick flashes, she glanced at the empty plates at the end of the counter and almost smiled. He comes in every day, she said. When Eleanor smiled back and started to speak, the girl turned her back and busied herself with the cups on the shelves, and Eleanor, feeling herself dismissed, rose gratefully from her coffee and took up her car keys and pocketbook. Goodbye, Eleanor said, and the girl, back still turned, said, Good luck to you. I hope you find your house. Okay. That was the last bit of uh, that we're going to listen to today of Haunting of Hill House. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, hang on a moment. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and... We've got another edition of Scary Stories Past and Present coming next Monday, Halloween itself. Same bat time, same bat channel, uh, and we will have Sumiko Salson with us. For today, our wonderful guest was Lauren Rhodes, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you are interested in reading more of her work, I highly recommend unsafe words um the book of short stories she read from earlier which <laughs> we are attempting to get here at berkeley public library shipping delays all kinds of stuff um and we have haunting a phil house in paperback and an audiobook thanks again for coming have a good afternoon bye all